I sat back in the comfortable leather chair and looked out at the Manhattan skyline through the large windows behind Marcus Reeves' desk. The opulent office was adorned with expensive paintings and items from the many expeditions carried out by Reeves himself, evidence of his financial stature and power. Reeves was a man in his fifties, graying hair, neat goatee, and if he was in the least perturbed, he was doing a really good job of setting a calm and cool demeanor while leaning against the mahogany desk. Ezra, I am glad you could come down so quickly, he said with some urgency. We have a situation requiring your attention. I nodded, becoming more interested. Yes, tell me about the expedition that has gone missing. Reeves pushed a folder over the desk to me. Dr. Lena Sorensen, a geologist, led a geological research team in the Arctic, searching for the final stretch of the Northwest Passage. Most of you were probably hoping for a slightly easier route, he said. Unfortunately, the expedition stopped communicating several weeks ago, and I don't know what has become of them. I thumbed through the folder and read the notes from Dr. Sorensen's findings. It is report of discovery of ancient civilization in Arctic by her. Exactly, Reeves nodded. Dr. Sorensen thought that this culture was alive and well at a time when the Arctic was quite a bit warmer and more habitable to human life. I looked at the grainy satellite pictures and the last coordinates provided by the expedition. And you want me to head up the search and rescue? Reeves nodded. Ezra, we are aware of your reputation. Your experience in the dangerous lands and knowledge of the ancient languages and cultures make you one of the few that can undertake this mission. Still, I couldn't help but to be intrigued by the challenge. The thought of exploring the unknown depths of the Arctic ice was an exciting one. I'm going to need a team, I said, already forming a plan in my mind. Some specialists that I've gathered, Reeves said. He pushed a button and opened the door to the office, revealing the two men. This is Jace Harding, ex-military and all-around tactical operator, said Reeves, indicating the muscular man with the close-cut dark hair and a gnarled scar on his forehead just above his left eye. Jace offered a brief nod, eyes assessing. Dr. Amara Patel. She is an archaeologist and an expert on ancient cultures. The diminutive woman with the long black hair and brown eyes, presumably Dr. Patel, beamed broadly at me. I shook hands with my new team members. When are we looking to get this done? I asked Reeves as I faced him again. Time is of the essence, Reeves answered. The Arctic weather is getting more and more difficult to predict, and the opportunity for a safe rescue is quickly narrowing. I'd say you have about a week before it gets too dangerous. I could feel the weight of my responsibilities setting in. I had one week to locate a missing expedition in the vastness of the Arctic. It was an impossible task, but I was good at impossible. I found myself thinking back to when the cap was schooling us. I remembered that strange symbol I'd seen in that picture of Dr. Sorensen's journal, and I couldn't place it. I didn't know what it meant, but it seemed like something I should be aware of. I turned to Dr. Patel, pondering if she had any insight into the unfamiliar icon. It might provide some clue. Leaving Reeves' office, I was filled with both anticipation and questions. This was it. The Arctic. I was sure this posting was going to be the hardest one I ever faced, but I was equally sure that I was going to give it my all and find out what happened and bring some closure to those that went missing. The sound of the helicopter diminished as I looked around at the frozen wasteland before me. White as far as the eye could see, with only the occasional jagged ice peak to break the monotony. The bitter cold air stung at my exposed flesh, and I was harshly reminded of exactly where I was in the world, and exactly where I wasn't going to be able to freely run around in simple, rain-soaked clothes. The two men that followed me out of the helicopter are Jace Harding and Dr. Amara Patel, we're all on this search and rescue mission together. We meet each other's eyes as we trail after one another to unload our equipment from the craft, each understanding the grim task ahead. I begin to organize the tents that the helicopter dropped with me, setting up the base camp with the help of the others, 
deploying the medical and emergency supplies as well. I had a strong sensation of loneliness in the area as we worked, and besides the howling wind and the sound of our boots on the ice, there was no other sound to be heard. The sun dipped low across the snow, casting long shadows. We got the camp set up, and then sat down together to figure out what we were going to do. We pulled the satellite images and some maps, and plotted out where Dr. Sorensen said they were headed. I proposed a grid search pattern to see if we could find any trace of the researchers. Jace, the former military man, proposed that we be on the lookout for any odd rock formations that might point to what had happened to the missing explorers. Dr. Patel, using her knowledge of archaeology, instructed us to make sure that we recorded everything we found, no matter how small or irrelevant it seemed. As we sat there and hashed out the final details of our plan, my thoughts kept returning to the symbol from that drawing in Dr. Sorensen's journal. For some reason, I just couldn't shake it, and I was sure it had to be relevant to what we were doing. I checked my watch. We were going to need to hurry. The Arctic weather was fickle, and we needed to get in and out with our information before things got too bad. Yeah, that sounded about right. We were all heading out into the frozen ass end of nowhere and had something to bring to the party. Jace knew tactics, Patel knew archaeology, and I knew how to get in and out of some nasty places and how to speak many of the dead languages. But when you boiled it all down, we were still just a bunch of idiots tromping around the tundra. I trudged through the snow, and with each step, I could feel the weight of the responsibility of finding the rest of the team. I was more than ready to learn the truth, whatever that might entail. The biting wind cut across my face as we pressed on, the sound of our footfalls muffled by the snow as they crunched and scrunched beneath our boots. The frozen tundra stretched before us, seemingly without end in its blanket of white. Still we went, motivated by our common purpose and the understanding that we were drawing nearer and nearer to whatever awaited us. Under the bright Arctic sun, we were approaching the last known location of the missing expedition. Jace Harding, Dr. Amara Patel and I trudged through the deep snow, our breath freezing in the icy air. Aside from the howling winds, the only other thing that could be heard were our footfalls. We crested the small ridge and stopped dead in our tracks at the scene in front of us. The campsite was a scene of utter chaos and destruction, with tents tattered and torn in shreds, blowing in the wind like broken flags. Equipment was strewn about haphazardly across the snow, as if dropped and left where it fell. Slowly, I made my way to the tent and raised the tattered entrance flap with my gloved hand, gingerly moving it aside and bracing myself to be faced with... whatever. Peering within, I stumbled back in shock and horror. In the tent, frozen and broken, were the mutilated bodies of a number of the crew, and the blood that had been spilled within the tent had begun to freeze as well causing even more violence to the scene. I tripped and fell over one of the bodies in shock. Jace and Dr. Patel both rushed over to my side when they noticed my reaction and saw the carnage, their expressions of concern turning to shock and revulsion. This was more than just a missing team. I figured we needed to search the other tents and structures for signs of what happened or survivors. Jace nodded moving into some sort of military stance, and turned to begin performing a visual sweep, looking for danger areas and anything that seemed out of place or that he should be aware of. Dr. Patel, her face white but resolute, pulled a camera from a side pocket of her bag and began taking photographs of the scene and bodies, making notes of the placement of the equipment and soldiers. That was it. We continued our work in silence, the only sounds being the wind and our boots in the snow. I thought of a hundred different questions and scenarios that might explain what we were seeing and experiencing, but nothing made any sense. One of them, I saw some strange symbol on his body, finely carved into his flesh. I recognized it then from the image in Dr. Sorensen's journal, and it sent an involuntary shiver down my spine, knowing what we would find. We searched the campsite and found the journal of Dr. Sorensen, its pages torn and bloodstained. I paged through it frantically, 
my eyes widening as I read more and more entries detailing weird occurrences and findings, the increasing unease of the crew. The final entry was in a hand I could only describe as shaking, with a set of coordinates, and the words, We have uncovered something ancient and evil. God forgive us all. I met Jace and Dr. Patel's eyes, needing to understand more, every second. We needed to know what had become of the crew and how to bring the responsible parties to justice. I didn't realize that what we had seen was only the tip of the iceberg, and that there were far more horrifying things lurking in the Arctic. As we prepared to make our way to the coordinates listed in the journal, I felt the weight of responsibility heavily. I promised myself that I would solve the mystery ahead of us. The Arctic had shown its severity already, but we were prepared to meet it head on. The sheriff and I looked over the ransacked campsite, and the horror of what we'd discovered turned to something else. Unease, I think. It was obvious that something had come through this camp like a battering ram, throwing tents and gear left and right, but as we started to inventory the destruction, things seemed... off. Uh, Jace? frowned Jace with concentration from the campsite. I don't think so. I don't see any of the others. There are too many bodies. I hesitated a moment, considering. If the rest of the crew weren't here, where would they be? We need to search further, I said, scanning the frozen ground. Perhaps they attempted to take shelter elsewhere. As I moved away from the pod and out onto the frozen ground, I saw that there were strange depressions in the snow leading from the collapsed pod towards the other three. It took me a moment to recognize that they were not depressions at all, but frozen tunnels and burrows through the ice itself. The smooth walls of the ice looked buffed and polished, and for a moment I almost believed that the ice walls were man-made. But that was impossible. Jace, Dr. Patel, come here and look at this, I said aloud, and a moment later they were there beside me, and their eyes went wide as well. We found a network of frozen ice tunnels leading out into the tundra, but they were... odd. Something unusual the more we explored, and then Dr. Patel suddenly exclaimed in shock. Found some bone fragments in the ice here. They appear to be human. We shared a look of unease at that, both of us even more horrified by this discovery of a human body within these things. I frowned. We must explore these tunnels, I said, looking down into the frozen darkness. They may tell us what happened to the others. Jace laid his hand on his knife. We don't know what's in there, he said, his eyes narrowing. It could be a trap or something else. Dr. Patel, for no other reason than her scientific curiosity, disagreed. We need to know, she maintained. There is a correlation between the crew and the structures. We cannot retreat now. We talked for a few moments and decided that we would explore the tunnels, provided that we did so with caution and that we were ready to beat a hasty retreat if we felt anything was amiss. As we began to climb downward, I felt like we were embarking on something that would undermine our chains of reality and make us different men. The mouth of the tunnel yawned open before us, a dark opening with glistening ice walls that almost looked wet in the dim sunlight. Behind it, the uniform rocks and roots of the mountain served as a grim reminder of where the passage could lead us if we didn't remain vigilant. If I didn't remain vigilant. There was nowhere to go now but into the darkness before me, into the high unknown. I took that first step into the unknown of the tunnel ahead, and the chill settled on my skin for more than the icy temperature. I also felt the unknown weight of responsibility upon my back, and knew that we would face whatever had to be faced together, both of us sure in our search for the missing miners. The temperature dropped more as we descended into the icy tunnels, and from this point, the air was stagnant. The smooth, damp, glossy walls of the tunnel sent shadows from our headlamps dancing, and the black maw of the tunnel swallowed our light. We could feel the tunnels begin to twist, shaping the tunnels deeper into the frozen tundra, our time on the surface a world far behind us now. The only sound was our breath and the mist of our words in the cold. I had the distinct sensation that we were being watched, some old, evil thing 
lurking just outside the range of our light. Jace led the way along the twisting maze, hand resting on the hilt of the knife, eyes darting about in search of threats. Dr. Patel followed closely, constrained by insecurity, and recorded our surroundings with her camera, the bright flashes of the beginning to drive the frost-framed walls of ice. Before me, etched into the ice, were old runic markings and symbols. I took a few steps closer and studied them. Although I was well-versed in many languages, I found myself unable to understand the script, the context having been lost to history. What do you make of this? I asked aloud. Jace and Dr. Patel were beside me now, and their expressions mirrored my own amazement and unease. We exchanged a glance, understanding that we had uncovered something far older and more enigmatic than we had supposed. We continued on further into the tunnels, the walls feeling as if they were closing in around us, and the shadows from our headlamps eerily concealing the hidden terrors that I knew must be lurking just out of the light. Dr. Patel took samples from the frozen walls, shaking hands as she did so. These glyphs are unfamiliar to me, she said quietly, almost breathlessly, with both excitement and fear. I nodded, my mind racing with the possibilities. The air seemed to grow heavy. Nothing but the sounds of our footsteps and the occasional creaking of ice could be heard. I had the constant sensation that something ancient and menacing was observing us. We pressed forward, danger or no, keeping to the task of discovering the fate of the lost expedition and whatever they found out here in the ice. A turn of the corridor opened up into a vast chamber, dark and foreboding, its walls adorned with esoteric symbols. I shivered, peering into the darkness. We were only just starting to scratch the surface of what lay ahead. We have to keep moving, I said, the strain evident in my voice. The answers to what happened to the expedition are deeper in these tunnels. Jace and Dr. Patel both acknowledged it. The three of us began forward into the chamber, headlamps vainly cutting the black and seemingly enclosing shadow. And that was when I felt the presence redouble in the tunnels, and I knew that we were about to make a discovery that would turn the world on its ear. The interior of the large main research tent was illuminated by several flickering lanterns as Jace, Dr. Patel and I stood over the huge table that dominated the space. We were analyzing the geological samples and photographs that had been laid out, listening to the wind howl outside as a constant reminder of the open expanse of this frozen wilderness, even from within the top-heavy tent. Dr. Patel, lit by the glow of the computer monitors, was crouched over one of the ice blocks and seemed to be studying the patterns present in the ice. These. Symbols, she said, almost breathlessly. They are completely unfamiliar to me. They are incredibly detailed and complex. I nodded, my interest growing. And you're positive this doesn't correspond to any known human culture? I wondered, studying the alien characters. Definitely, said Dr. Patel. These symbols predate any known history by many thousands of years. We are seeing things here that would rewrite our understanding of the beginning of civilization as we know it. Jace frowned as he peered at the images. There is something more, he said. The tunnels, they are not man-made. They appear to be organic, like they grew here somehow, rather than being dug. Jace's words set a chill down my spine, hinting at some deep and horrifying thing buried under the Arctic ice. We looked around more, and it began to feel like an uneasy place. There were too many secrets and too many things that we didn't know. The silence was breached by the sound of the tent flap opening, and we all looked up as Marcus Reeves entered. Have you discovered something? He barked, striding over to the table. I stood up and looked at Marcus. We found something amazing. The symbols and layout of the tunnels that we've exposed are not consistent with anything that I've seen in the past. They predate any known human civilization. Marcus looked a little startled. What about the missing expedition? Have you found any trace of them? I shook my head, feeling frustrated. No, I said, but I believe the truth is in those tunnels. We must press on and find out what is hiding beneath the ice. Then you have my support, 
Marcus said seriously, his jaw clenched. I will lend whatever resources I can to this end. It is imperative that we know. Marcus walked away, and we all just stood there shuffling our feet for a long, silent moment. Dr. Patel, Jace, and me, all looking between each other in turn, silently acknowledging the enormity of what lay before us. We had to keep going. We couldn't turn back. The secrets of this Arctic landscape seemed to demand that we uncover the truths laid down thousands or millions of years ago. The rest of the night was spent poring over the samples and photographs, our brains awash with theories and thoughts. The shadows of the flickering lanterns danced across the walls of the tent, and I could almost feel the darkness moving with the unknown. I sat back in the chair and watched the tent flap sway with the frozen breeze outside, the frozen, snow-covered white of the endless Arctic tundra hiding everything out there. I knew that the way forward was likely to be dangerous and that risks and uncertainties lay ahead, but we had to press on. The fate of the missing expedition of humanity depended on us. I spun back to the table and began working on the next piece. I'd seen what the Arctic had hidden thus far, but I knew that the real challenge was still waiting. Further into the frozen passageways we moved. The chill in the air continued to increase, and the weight of something nearly imperceptible began to press at the edges of my consciousness. Whispers. Imagined at first, but growing in volume and pervasiveness until I was certain they existed. I cast glances at both Jace and Dr. Patel and saw mirrored reactions on their faces, the same reach to our handguns, the same examination of the shimmering walls for ambush. I thought I could see movement in the shadows just at the edge of my vision, but for some reason they moved independent of our own steps. A sudden unease began to creep through me as I realized that my mind was thinking about whether these phantoms could be just figments of the flickering illumination and not something more sinister. After that, our equipment began failing. Our radios filled with static and GPS units just powered off, while the satellite phones refused to connect. I felt suddenly very cut off and very alone, and very cold. I shook my head and ignored the looks of concern from my two companions. Whatever it was that was happening, I felt like we were on the verge of figuring something out. I addressed Jace and Dr. Patel, turning back to them as I spoke. We can't go back now, I said. We're getting close to something. I can sense it. We need to keep moving forward. Jace shook his head, his instincts flashing. Ezra, we can't go in there blind. It's dangerous. Dr. Patel, his fear now mixed with equal parts of curiosity, looked back to me. Jace is right, Ezra. We must be cautious. But we cannot disregard what we have observed. We must document it, gather data. I nodded. We will be careful, but we cannot avoid it. The answers we need lie forward. We must know what is there. The whispers were growing louder as we made our way further into this icy maze, and the frozen walls seemed to reverberate them in all directions. I felt briefly that shadows flitted about me, that some dark movement could be seen from the corners of my eyes, but when I turned my head, it was gone. The malevolent presence that had been at the back of my mind seemed to grow in strength, and I had the distinct and oppressive sensation of not just being watched, but watched by the unseen. I kept moving the team forward, shining the headlamp on the dark walls and turning the flashlight to and fro, more carvings and symbols coming into view all around us, the tunnels snaking and bending like the trembling fingers of a lightning-stricken man. We were in a large chamber with a tall ceiling and a tall monolith in the middle of it, covered with glowing symbols. The whole chamber was vibrating with energy, and I felt myself being pulled towards the monolith, I glanced back at Jace and Dr. Patel, both of them illuminated by the light. We were on the brink of something huge, something that could rewrite the history books. I moved forward, eager to find out what secrets lay ahead. The frozen tunnels had been a challenge, sure, but I felt that the real challenge was right in front of us now. Standing before the great monolith, I just felt that we were here, that we were meant to be here, now, 
and that we needed to unravel the mysteries that had been locked away for so long. The murmurs and dark images were some of the pieces of the puzzle that we had only just now begun to figure out. I turned to my team, and the expressions of wonder and fear on their faces mirrored my own. We would confront whatever this was, and we would discover the truth within. The secrets of the Arctic had been revealed, and I had no doubt there were more to come. I took another step forward, embracing the unknown, and ready to confront the enigma that had drawn us here. We found ourselves in a large chamber of the frozen tunnels, the walls covered with millions of delicate ice formations from floor to ceiling, reflecting bluely in the light of our headlamps. The air in the room was oppressive and felt as though it had not been exposed to the world above in untold millennia. Further within the chamber, I spied what must have been the frosted corpses of some decidedly unrecognizable creatures, their twisted forms and elongated limbs, as well as the sharp claws, giving away their alien anatomy, preserved within the ice. I took a few steps closer to the nearest of the bodies, feeling my heart beating in my chest as I looked upon its grotesque visage. It almost appeared to have no neck, and the head seemed to grow directly from its chest, and I shivered. Dr. Patel was very interested in the chamber now, and was carefully cataloging everything she could. She snapped pictures and drew what I assumed to be very detailed sketches of the ice formations throughout the room, and of the frozen… things. Her voice shook as she spoke, and she turned to me as she began to gather samples of the ice and organic material into sterile containers, her eyes alight with fear and exhilaration. Ezra, do you know what this implies? she said, eyes wide. We are within an undocumented pocket dimension, one that has lain undiscovered for millennia. It is impossible. These things are evolved along an entirely different path. I nodded, my mind already spinning. We are in a place with different rules now, I said as I studied the frozen alien shapes. The knowledge in this chamber could rewrite Earth's history. Jace had been keeping a sharp eye on the entrance to this chamber, his weapon at the ready and I could have kissed him. I kept looking for movement and grew more and more uncomfortable with the lack of it. We should be careful, I said quietly, the threat of dangers I'd already encountered here and more that I surely wasn't aware of, making it difficult to relax. As I moved about the chamber, I noticed some odd symbols that had been inscribed on the walls. I was very interested in ancient languages and spent some time making detailed notes of the various symbols in hopes of some identifying of the hidden realm. The patterns of the intricate alien glyphs felt almost that they sent, and I was sure that they must be some sort of tool to learn more about the beings that called this place home. Even though we'd found it, there was something uneasy about it. The frozen alien forms, with their dead black eyes and monstrous forms, seemed to be staring back at us, patiently biding their time before breaking forth from the frozen tomb. I looked to Jace and Dr. Patel and knew from their expressions that they felt that same danger. We readied ourselves to exit the chamber and investigate more of the icy tunnels. I surveyed the marvels we had found and several thoughts raced through my mind. This was only the start of what we could find here, only the beginning of what the Arctic might reveal to humanity. We needed to move forward. We entered into the frozen tunnels, prepared for whatever we would face. The Arctic had revealed its secrets, but there were more to be found. We pressed on, sensing that we were nearing something that would change everything we thought we knew. I pressed on further into the frozen tunnels, feeling very alone. I was separated from Jace and Dr. Patel now due to the collapse. I shouted for them, but received no reply. A shiver danced its way down my spine, beyond the chill of the air around me. I continued forward, finding my way through the tunnels, shadows from my headlamp flickering along the walls. I could feel the chill in the air growing, becoming more stagnant. I had the unnerving sensation like the ice around me was somehow alive, like it was watching me, anticipating the moment to crush my body. I turned a corner and saw the ice walls carved with the ruins, their architecture unlike anything I had seen before in such an ancient place, with twisted spires and grotesque sculptures adorning the ice-encrusted walls. 
I snapped more pictures of the ruins, flashing the camera to bring out the detail of the strange stone constructions. In the ruins, I came upon a chamber that left me frozen. The bodies of the lost members of the expedition were within, entangled among the ice in some grotesque frozen embrace. Their frozen faces were locked in contorted terror, mouths agape and staring sightlessly. I felt the bile rise in my throat as I understood that they must have encountered horrors beyond the simple arctic cold. I need almost to all the others of the corpses. Larval men were drawn to heat and activity, and they'd be all over me like a pack of rabid dogs to fresh meat if I stayed here any longer. The rest of the bodies must be here in one of those egg sacks, and I didn't want to stay and wait for them to get hungry. I tried to make sense of what I was looking at, the members of the Lost Expedition must have uncovered something ancient and unimaginable, something that had been hiding in the frozen dark for countless years. And now, here I stood, all alone, facing something from the same nightmares that had claimed them. I was in the middle of snapping pictures of it when I heard the screeching. It was far away at first, but it was getting closer. I knew I was no longer by myself down here. My hands shook as they gripped the camera. I had no choice but to press on. I had to find the missing adventurers, or I was going to wind up just like them. I gazed around the chamber at the bodies of the others from the expedition. I needed to get out of these tunnels and get back to the surface and warn others about what was waiting down here. But before I could do that, I needed to figure out what the hell the secrets were to these old ruins and what the hell had killed the others. Inhaling deeply, I entered back into those frost-covered tunnels. I was alone here and needed to understand what all this hidden shit beneath the Arctic was about. What lay beyond, I was certain that I was on the edge of what would be the most important discovery of the age. I staggered out of the frigid tunnels into the harsh Arctic wind, freezing it, freezing it exposed frozen landscape before me. The sunlight was diminishing, casting a dim glow on the sheet of snow before I tripped and paused to gather my thoughts, trying to make sense of what I'd seen down there. I felt a fresh, painful, and a terrible journey, and trying to systems ached between each I sub-snow-covered ground in chaotic, fresh reminders. I neared the base camp and saw that it was abandoned. The tents lay in tatters, snowmobiles half-buried. Jace? Dr. Patel? I croaked, the sounds of my panic only echoing back to me on the wind. It only then occurred to me that my companions had been split up in the collapse. I realized that I was worried that they hadn't fared any better than the missing party members. I entered the main tent, searching for some sign of where my team may have gone. It was pandemonium inside, papers and equipment scattered all over the floor, and the comm equipment smashed. What had happened here while I was outside? The signs of either a hasty exit or struggle were plain to see, and an icy finger of unease traced up my spine. In the rubble, I uncovered the journal of Dr. Lena Sorensen, and as I thumbed through the pages, I found wild notes and some very distressing detailed drawings of this same warped architecture amidst some of the descriptions within the passages. The things she'd drawn and the symbols described spoke of some malevolent force beneath our feet in the ice, and frightened, nervous final entry spoke of an awakened evil and the necessity to flee. I sank into a chair, my head swimming. If the first team had been here, no, it wasn't possible. I needed to decide if I should continue to search for Jace and Dr. Patel or go for help. I couldn't just leave them here, but I couldn't stay here alone either. The wind began to howl outside the tent, and I knew we were running out of time. Whatever lay beneath the ice was growing in strength, and my team was in danger. I had to do something, anything, and the only thing I had were the notes I had read in Dr. Sorensen's journal. The ones that talked about the thing that had taken out the first team. It was time to head back down into the frozen deep. I spent the minutes getting my gear together and checking over everything, trying to decide if I felt like I could be the only person able to be able to stop whatever was going on down here and not be more scared to face those abominations and that malign influence in the tunnels than anything. 
As I approached the mouth of the tunnel, a growing sense of trepidation began to take over. The icy walls appeared to be alive with some sort of energy, and a chill hung heavier in the air. I knew that my real test of determination was still ahead of me, deep within the heart of these ancient ruins where so many had died in the past. I entered the darkness, feeling the heaviness of my task settling on me. The Arctic had unveiled its darkest mystery. My team's fate and perhaps the fate of all mankind lay on my shoulders. I felt that I was so close to some revelation, some history-altering piece of knowledge as I ventured further in the dark. The chill depths of the passage awaited. My fear was still fresh as I found myself once again making my way through the frigid darkness. The twisting maze of tunnels had grown familiar after my earlier exploration, and I was able to navigate with the assist of my headlamp, casting long shadows on the walls and floor of the passage. The air felt colder and heavier, and the only sound was the frequent dripping of thawing ice in the low tunnel. I kept moving further into this hidden place, feeling the fatigue from my previous way there and very much alone. I had to move forward. I had to find out what the hell was going on and figure out what happened to Jace and Dr. Patel, my two missing teammates. I had been concerned about both of them since we became separated during the cave-in. I moved forward, it passed the twisted architecture and grotesque carvings and the pulsing network of those pulsing veins throughout the walls that I'd noticed. It could almost visualize the long-lost members of the expedition and the hideous cocooned bodies I'd seen before. It had the distinct impression that something was watching me from the shadows, some malevolent force that I couldn't directly perceive. I could feel the fear in the pit of my stomach, and I was sure that I was drawing close to the heart of the ancient evil. Out of the darkness it came, a monstrous thing covered in writhing tentacles and lidless eyes, something ancient and evil and unimaginable. Some base instinct buried deep within my subconscious kept me moving as I remembered the lessons of Dr. Sorensen and his journal. I dodged quickly and sure-footedly around its attacks, and I was very familiar with the terrain I was on. Its howls echoed throughout the tunnels, and its tentacles lashed at me swiftly. I had managed to make a weapon of some of the scrap equipment and had been able to strike the creature effectively enough to cause it to stagger briefly. I ran as fast as I could to the opening of the hidden realm. The injured and enraged thing with the tentacles was pursuing me through the frozen tunnels, and I made my way to the surface and began setting explosions and causing cave-ins, collapsing the entrance and isolating the hidden realm from above. I couldn't hear the howling screech of the creature after it was buried by the collapse of the entrance, and I sank to my knees, drained and gasping for breath. So long as I'd kept the old thing from getting out, I was happy to take the losses. I knew that it wasn't the end of my battle against the old menaces. The ones I'd faced in the frozen darkness below had prepared me for what was ahead, and I knew I needed to find assistance. With a burst of energy, I turned back towards the surface, my thoughts returning to the elders and their need and the need to uncover the truth about what lay under the ice in the Arctic. The cold wind stung my face as I stepped from the tunnels. There was still my friends to find and the threat of the ancient ones to combat. But I had lived, and I knew something now, from a new challenge in this harsh place. I moved on. I staggered out of the frigid waters, the sun slanting through the morning fog of the Arctic morning in a strange light upon the frozen landscape. My body was aching all over, and my head was spinning from my encounter with the something that had lurked beneath the water. I was having a difficult time maintaining my footing upon the slick ice, and my breath was coming out in ragged gasps. The base camp came into view, and I was thankful to see it after what I had seen. Another team of searchers came out to meet me. They were all dressed in thick winter clothing and weapons, and looked alarmed at my bedraggled form. The team administered to my injuries and cared for me as I recovered, setting their gazes on me as I told them of the hidden world beneath the ice and of the beings that had survived there. I could see their expressions change from disbelief to one of terror as they considered my words. Even as they tried to rationalize it, I could see the doubt in their eyes. They were men of science and exploration. 
The notion of some ancient terror trapped far below the Arctic ice was almost nonsensical. I didn't fault them for their skepticism, but the reality needed to be exposed at any price. The search team had begun to explore the subterranean region where the hidden world had been discovered, and I had become fixated on discovering what I could about the ancient horrors. I pored over the notes and artifacts left by the previous search team, studied all I could about the entities and their relationship to the frozen tundra. I couldn't stop thinking about what had happened to the others. I worried about what left of them in the dark, frozen depths, and how they had met their fate. They never managed to find any sign of them, and the hidden sector remained sealed and impassable, hiding whatever it was that had killed my team and kept that access point choked with ice and snow. I felt like I was missing something, but I couldn't place it. Days became weeks, and I found myself obsessing more and more about it. I couldn't sleep for thinking of how this ageless horror worked and what it meant for mankind. The base search team had grown concerned for my health and tried to convince me to return to some semblance of civilization, but I couldn't. I wouldn't be able to sleep until I had figured it all out, no matter the cost to myself. When the search team were preparing to leave the Arctic, I decided to continue investigating the hidden world and all its mysteries. I understood the peril and unknowns that lay before me, but I decided I needed to know. I stood there until the search team disappeared from view, then turned my attention to what was revealed here in the Arctic. My exploration was not yet complete. The things I'd seen here would keep me moving forward, keep me searching for answers. I faced the frozen horizon again, searching for the answers lying frozen under the ice. I didn't know what lay ahead, but I knew that I was prepared to face it, no matter the danger. The Arctic had singled me out for this, and I wasn't going to stop until I had found out all it wanted to teach me.